Hi, everyone. Welcome to our TRIO and alumni education panel. Um, we hope you are all doing well at home, and uh, hopefully we'll all be able to get back on campus soon. Um, I'm so excited that the panelists were able to join us today. Uh, we know that some of you in the TRIO program uh, wanted, had a little bit of interest in school counseling, so we made sure to cover that completely on this panel. Um, so what we'll do is we'll go around and we'll have everyone introduce themselves and, and, and then we'll get going. First of all, I'm Liz uh, and I am your alumni coordinator. So you'll probably see and hear from me a lot when you guys graduate. So um, I'm so happy that we were able to do this for you. So we'll go ahead and start and we'll kind of go around and everyone can introduce themselves and they'll tell you uh, what they do and kind of what they've done because a lot of them have had multiple jobs. So we'll go ahead and we'll start with uh, Josette Smith. Hi, um, I'm Josette Smith. Currently, I am a middle school math teacher at Elmwood Village Charter School. Uh, prior to that, I taught inclusion at Elmwood Village as well, uh, fourth grade and sixth grade inclusion. I'm certified um, as an elementary school teacher and as a math teacher. Prior to that, I was a counselor, which I still practice uh, one day a week. I'm a licensed social worker, licensed clinical social worker. Um, so I use that in my practice also as a teacher. And then we'll go to Ray Bailey. Hello, um, I'm currently the assistant principal at Sweet Home Middle School. Uh, I've been there for about two years, uh, but before I became uh, an administrator, I was a school counselor uh, at the Stanley G. Falk School. I worked mainly with uh, high school students there, uh, and I was there for about seven years. Okay, and then we'll go to Sarah Rizzo. Hi, I'm Sarah Rizzo. I graduated in 2012-2013 uh, from Medai, and i um, I have been teaching for eight years, uh, starting as a substitute teacher and working my way up. And currently I work as a uh, reading interventionist teaching assistant. Um, I work with grades K to four, um, helping with interventions, uh, RTI and enrichment for kids who need a little extra, something more in the classroom. Awesome. I should say, generally, like most of our panelists, these are alumni. Um, we'll go to Kristen Hatta. Hi, I'm Kristen Hatta. Um, currently, I am the high school assistant principal at Maryvale School District. Um, I've had a various, uh, various different positions um, behind me. Um, last year at Maryvale, I was their 21st Century uh, Community Learning Center program director. Uh, previous to that, I was a school principal at Mary Queen of Angels here in Chictawaga, New York. Um, and then prior to teaching, um, I served as an assistant principal. Also, um, I spent the bulk of my teaching years as a literacy specialist and special education teacher. Um, I'm certified birth through six in LED, special ed, and literacy, and then administration. All right. And then lastly, Marianne Singleton. Hi, my name is Marian Singleton. I am currently a principal and manager of special education programs uh, for Buffalo Hearing and Speech. Uh, it's a preschool program for students with special needs. My background uh, is in special education. I taught for eight years, uh, pre-K all the way through 12th grade, 12-1-1, um, 15-1, integrated co-teaching, and consultant teaching. So I've done uh, a range of things. Okay, all right, well, we'll just dive right in. Um, we will start, looks like we lost Josette. There she is, okay. Nope, sorry. <laughs> that, that's all right, technology. Um, mm -hmm. We'll start with, with Ray. So you mentioned that before you were an assistant principal, you were um, a counselor. What made you decide to, to switch to the administration side and, and do you still use some of the things that, that I should say that you had you used your tools when you were a counselor in your current position. Yeah, so um, when I was a counselor at the at the Falk School, I felt like uh, a lot of my duties uh, were also uh, kind of like administrative duties as well. So, you know, kind of whether it be like setting up scheduling or you know, regents, you know, things like that. Um, very much similar to what I do now at Speed Home. But um, I feel like a lot of the skills I I took away as a counselor, I 
use every day as a principal. Um, so, you know, at Falk, uh, I was also, uh, I also taught therapeutic crisis interventions, so a lot of like uh, lower intervention skills to, to help students, you know, kind of deescalate and, and deregulate and uh, kind of like repair relationships and things like that. Um, so a lot of those skills, you know, I like to take into, into being a, an administrator, uh, you know, kind of help, help bridge that gap, um, you know, between teacher and student or, uh, you know, home and school. So, um, you know, I, I feel like that, that, uh, those skills as a counselor really serve me well as an administrator now. Cool. Um, Kristen, what do you think our students need to know about today's education world that can kind of get them to that next level compared to, to students that are at other colleges? Is there kind of a, a, a leg up for people that are competing for similar jobs? Um, I think that um, a lot of the uh, skills that are needed in today's field in education are really those soft skills that technically aren't taught inside of a classroom or getting that education through a book. Um, a lot of it is, I think, gained through experience and the various placements that you have and also building resources um, and connections with people that you meet. Um, I think it's very important to, you know, relationship building skills I found is very important. And a lot of the great leaders that I've had the opportunity to work under really thrive and promote building relationships with families, with students, and getting involved in the local community. So I think having those kinds of skills are very important because on paper, a lot of us look very similar, but I think it's that personal touch through personal connections and relationships that really set people apart from one another. So students kind of in our other um, panel discussions, we always talk about networking. And that's essentially, I think, what, what Kristen is saying, just it's a different type of networking um, in regards to education. So that's really good to know. Um, Josette, what, was there one thing that inspired you or made you want to become a teacher? And if so, is that reflected in your teaching now? Yeah, um, I, like I had said, I was a counselor prior to this, and I was actually at one of the city schools um, as an intervention counselor and as a crisis counselor um, through the county, and I was called out all the time, um, I was actually at Lafayette, to intervene in classrooms with students who are having difficulties, with the teachers, with classmates, um, and children who were either on pins or uh, involved in the juvenile justice system in other ways. And what I found when I was working with the kids is there was no relationship. So it was that disconnect of knowing who they felt like they could trust. So knowing that relationships were really important, these kids had the ability to learn. Every kid has the ability to learn at extremely high levels. However, they had no connection to the actual classroom. So throughout doing that, I thought, you know, I can use these skills that I have and make connections with kids to make them feel like they're part of something bigger and something better and want to be in the classroom and want to learn. Um, so that's actually what led me into teaching was my counseling that I started doing inside the school system. Very interesting. Do you, were you expecting, I guess any of you, the um, connection that you would feel with the students before you actually got into a classroom? Hmm. I don't know. I guess it's kind of a hard, uh, for me personally, I've always been a person about connections, but it's a different kind of connection, I guess. So yes and no. I was hoping to have it, but I didn't know how to go about having that connection, if that makes any sense. I think so. I think so. It's, I think it's um, from coming from a family of teachers, I'm like the black sheep of the family, not being a teacher. Um, this, the, the fact that you remember all the students' names, you know their personal stories, it's just, it shows that it's such a deeper connection. Um, so I find that interesting. Um, Sarah, first of all, can you tell us a little bit, first of all, can you explain exactly what RTI is? And then can you explain a little bit more about your work with it and how you support the students? So, um, RTI uh, has worn different hats throughout the years. Uh, currently, what it means for my job is um, the right to intervention. So, students who are struggling, um, maybe not doing so well in um, reading or math, 
uh, have the opportunity to meet for a half hour uh, in a small group or individually, and um, we work on the skills that they need some help with. Um, so I work with grades K to four. So for kindergarten, that can mean honestly just figuring out their letter sounds, identifying their letters, their letter names, their numbers, helping them write their name, and even uh, as basic as coming in in the morning, where do I put my backpack? Where do I put my coat? Where do I, my boots go? You mean they don't go on the floor? Okay, so where do they go? Uh, and then in first grade, uh, there's a lot of practice with study reading and uh, getting fluent in reading and math and figuring out how to add and subtract and the different things. Sorry, my dog wants to join in on the meeting. <laughs> Second grade, we are working on like uh, math centers. Uh, so playing games and learning the math concepts that they would learn um, in like a textbook, but they're learning by playing and then they don't even realize, hey, I'm actually understanding this concept. And then third and fourth grade, we really um, practice the skills of reading uh, longer text and then going back to the text and finding um, answers for like multiple choice or short answers, because we all know those New York State tests, that's what they are looking for. So um, I kind of help out wherever I'm needed. Cool. Um, Marion, so you're kind of, uh, before your specialty is, is special education, what made you decide to kind of go that route to, to choose special education? So it was pretty interesting because I always figured that I wanted to do something where I could help. And sometimes you don't really know what that is until you start looking at the stuff that you do on an everyday basis. Um, and it kind of led me into teaching. And at Madai, there's the dual certification. So um, I was in English ed as well as special ed. So. I was pretty set. I'm going to be an English teacher. I'm going to teach middle school English because I love my eighth grade English teacher. She was awesome. I'm going to be like her. Um, and we did so much coursework with uh, students with disabilities, special ed. One of my classes, I remember uh, we did a lot of field work at the Cantalesian Center one to two times a week on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And I absolutely loved it. Didn't really think I would fall in love with it the way that I did. And after that, it was just such a genuine love for the students um, and how warm and welcoming and just so pure that they were and just so good hearted. And just being able to make those small differences with them that I really, really loved. So that's what lead me, led me into special education. Um, was just with my coursework at Madai, and it was nice to actually be able to get hands-on and into the school setting because I could see it, and that was, I want to say, like my sophomore year. So I was able to early on figure out what I wanted to do. Again, not knowing exactly where it would lead me, but just kind of pointing me in the right direction. So, Ray, uh, obviously we're, we're doing this because of COVID-19, we're doing it this way. And I know that the education world was kind of, you know, thrown a fastball and trying to adapt to this. Um, what would you say now that, that we're, you know, over a month into it, what's your outlook on the positives and the negatives of this? And, and meaning, um, you know, the different values within, this, within the school day um, in regards to, you know, teachers having to adapt to online teaching and what does that mean for the students? What does that mean for the teachers? I guess the general question is, have you seen both, what are the positives and the negatives out of this experience that you've been able to see so far? Yeah, so I think uh, just along like the same, same lines of everyone else has been saying, you know, uh, relationships uh, has kind of been a theme that I've been hearing so far. And uh, an interesting thing coming into uh, Sweet Home was that myself and our principal both got hired at the same time. And I think we really meshed together because, you know, we're, we're big with, you know, the relationship, getting to know people. Um, you know, you can always find us out in the hallway and, uh, you know, just being visible and getting to know our kids. So I think that kind of gave us uh, a leg up with this where, you know, really, I, I think our, our main goal during this whole, whole time is to make sure that everyone's okay. So, um, you know, I, I, I've 
fairly certain many other districts are doing the same thing that we're doing with uh, in terms of like meal distribution. Um, so, you know, I'm at the building a couple couple days a week or someone's at the building a couple days a week, you know, hand out meals. Um, you know, we're calling, calling uh, families regularly, we're emailing, we're following up um, just to make sure that they're all okay. Um, and, and, you know, I mean, now that we're, we're out of school, kind of past this um, spring break and, you know, our teachers are starting new instruction. It's been, you know, making sure that our teachers can, uh, you know, successfully, uh, you know, use the technology, whether it be, you know, uh, we're, we're a big Schoology uh, school, so making sure that they can can use Schoology and, and post their materials and, you know, what help do they need. So, um, you know, on that line, you know, getting teachers to uh, that kind of professional development. And then on the, on the back end, um, you know, really just if, if we're not seeing kids participate um, you know, within Schoology, if they're not turning in assignments, if they're not, you know, emailing their teacher for help, um, it's somebody in our, our school, you know, reaching out to say, hey, are, are, are you okay? Um, you know, do, do you need anything? Because, um, you know, as this, uh, as, as this uh, virus spreads, um, you know, it's bound to, to hit home at, at some point. So, um, you know, I'm sure each of us can, can share a, a, a story of, you know, someone that we know that maybe has, has lost someone or, um, you know, has, has beat it. But, you know, in, in the grand scheme of things, you know, right now, I think it's, it's more so about taking care of our, our mental health, making sure that, um, you know, we, we stay a community and, and we're, we're there for, for one another. Um, and then, you know, if, if, we're, if we're doing that, that learning, that's, that's, a, that's a great, great positive too. Do you think from an administration standpoint, that when everyone is allowed to, to return, do you think it's going to have, um, uh, do you think it's gonna in, in inspire or influence future decisions? Do you think it's gonna have an effect on, on day to day? You know, I, that, that's, that's kind of tough to think of right now. I, I think when we get back, I think everyone's just gonna be so excited just to be back in a building and, uh, you know, around their coworkers and around our students. I think that that is going to be a tremendous day full of, you know, celebration and, um, you know, just, uh, just, just joy. So, uh, you know, I can't wait to get to that day and, um, you know, kind of like this whole thing has gone, it's, it's ever changing. So, you know, once we get back in the building, I'm sure it'll, it'll come their own, uh, own challenges, which, uh, you know, I, I know that, I know we got great people in our district and, and we'll figure it out and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll make sure that everyone is, is safe and uh, that we can return in, a, in, a, in the best way possible. So, um, you know, I'll look forward to that challenge when we get there. <laughs> Kristen, I kind of asked this of, of Ray earlier, but what influenced your decision um, to kind of decide to go the administrative direction instead of classroom? Um, a lot of my past experiences, um, when I worked as the RTI literacy specialist, um, a lot of the duties I was assigned by my building principal were um, a lot of administrative type duties. Um, and then I also uh, felt that, you know, I just, I really enjoy connecting with people, building relationships with people and being able to be a catalyst for change. Um, I feel that having a background starting out, you know, as a substitute, um, I was a teacher assistant, I was a classroom teacher, an assistant principal, a principal, a behavioral specialist, and I've seen a lot of different views from a lot of different positions. And I think having that background and then coming up to the administrative role, I'm able to view things from a different lens. Um, I'm also a parent now as well. Um, so I like to take that parent perspective along with the teacher perspective and administrative perspective, take all of those views and really be able to help people meet a common ground to really help kids be successful. Um, okay, moving on. Josette, and I know this is like a very heavy question to ask because I'm sure the answer is a lot, um, but what is something that you did not learn in your coursework or your time um, at school that you wish you knew before heading in? Oh, Josette, I think you're muted. Hang on, you're unmuted. Sorry, my daughter's No, that's all right. Um, that's the hard one for me only because of my background in social work. Mm -hmm. Looking back though, if I was to look at that, now I graduated from a die a long time ago. Um, I would say for me, I don't feel like enough was talked about 
how important relationships really were. I think that there's so much, there's so much focus on academics and curriculum and materials that are important for the kids to learn and the kids to get through and what expectations are and how do you deliver things that we say that relationships are important, but we never really give people the direction in which to go with that. You know, a lot of people fall into like the friendships when they're new teachers and how do you set those boundaries and what are those limits? So I think for me, I would say the biggest piece missing would be that extra coursework on what it is to actually build a relationship with a student. How do you do that professionally and not cross that line? Because there's a it's it's a fine line and it's real easy sometimes for people to think that they're walking the right path and then realize that they have to kind of pull back and they may have made a, a mistake or a bad choice in a relationship. So I think relationship building is huge. And I think that that's one part that I personally would have missed out on had I not had the background I had. Um, does anyone else want to add to that? I saw a lot of head shaking. So I feel like everyone agrees. The yeah, and, and, you know, I mean, for as much as you might be able to learn in, in a, a class as well, I mean, I, I, I feel a lot of it is, is you know, kind of trial and error and, and, and learning, learning uh, from that too. So, you know, yeah. we talked about networking as well. So, you know, you, you get, you get great people in your corner that, that you can talk to and, you know, whether, uh, you know, it's, it's, if it's someone at, at Madai, uh, you know, Jim Brace was someone that, that uh, I, I frequently reached out to and, uh, and, and talked to and, uh, you know, kind of learn from. So, you know, you, as a new teacher, you're going to make, you're going to make, uh, uh, choices that you know could have been better at, at some point. We've mm -hmm. all done it, uh, but you know, just learning learning from those experiences and, and talking about it with people um, uh, to, to you know learn learn how to make a good choice in the future. I would agree. Speaking of, I I would say um, something that you can't learn from your courses uh, is that you have to learn those kids' names. You have to learn what makes them tick. You have to. Mm -hmm take that time and build a relationship with them and get to know them as people and know that they're going to have off days as well. They're going to have days they come in and they don't want to uh, do their work. They don't want to participate and maybe something uh, is going on at home or something is going on with them uh, mentally or emotionally. And I think that's they, they do a lot of work at Madai teaching those things in like our psychology courses and stuff, but you don't you just kind of think okay in one ear out the other in your class and then when you're actually in the classroom it really starts to take presence and you have to actually be there and understand and try and cope with that mm -hmm. um sarah kind of on the lines of things offered at madai um can you speak to taking advantage of programs and services offered on campus um i know that that you're you're, were you a tutor in TRIO? Were you, you were a part of, of some sort of a student service? So I started out, I have been a part of the academic support and TRIO team for about 12 years now. <laughs> I was a student doing federal work study in the academic support center office and at the time TRIO was also uh, connected with that office and so I kind of served as a work study for both offices um, and then maybe my third year at Madai, I became a, a tutor for English and writing. Um, and I benefited from the tutoring services at the center just because you work there and you see tutors there and you're struggling in the class and it's like, okay, I need some help. Um, so I, I would say uh, the services offered at Madai um, in terms of uh, tutoring services and uh, then found out I think my fourth year, Madai, my last year when I was about to start student teaching, but I actually qualified for the TRIO services. And um, I got to say, if you take advantage and just apply and see if you can get into those services, they're extremely beneficial. They helped uh, immensely when it came time for my teacher certification exams and getting practice tests and just allowing me that time to uh, study and prep and uh, so they they really were a helping hand uh, throughout my undergrad years. And then uh, when I came back to Madai as a graduate student, um, 
it was just really beneficial to use the tutoring center uh, for uh, that computer and printing services. Um, uh, I know I, when I was living at home, my parents lived in the dark ages and they had uh, like the very early internet connection. So it was very helpful to come to Madai and be able to not hear the ee, ee, like you were like loading your uh, web page for your assignment for Madai. So um, Madai really uh, has some great services and um, yeah. Awesome. That's that's great to hear. That's a consistent message. So that that's good that we hear that. Um, I know we've talked a lot about you know why you did this or what maybe you missed out on. But Kristen, can you talk about what is the best thing about being an educator right now? I think the best thing about being an educator is just again like you get to make some really strong connections with students, with family. Um, I actually uh, live in uh, the Maryvale community myself. So I think just being able to be a part of my community, um, really get to see, you know, when you get to see the students and the impact it's making in the world around you, um, I think that's a pretty powerful thing um, just to be able to see, you know, how to prepare these kids for what's coming. Um, I know at our school right now we have a, um, a NAF program which um, works with the area of hospitality and um, getting these kids really prepared for business and those types of fields. And you get to really see the fruit of these kids coming into the local community and just how they're making it a better place. So I think just getting to see the impact on the local communities with our kids is great. That's awesome. Um, Marion, I know I asked this of Ray earlier about from an administrative standpoint, but you know, your work in the classroom and your work now as the program director, how do you think COVID is going to change um, the day-to-day -day operations or just, again, the relationships inside the classroom when this is all over and, and everyone's able to return? I think one of the big things that it will affect um, just day-to-day -day building operations, kind of just like we're cleaning constantly inside the home. I think that's going to be huge just with like custodial staff coming in, uh, what is getting done, when is it getting done, how often is it getting done, um, knowing that things are clean and sanitized and, and safe for everyone. Being a preschool program for students with special needs, we are hands-on 100% of the time. Uh, we have kids, I mean, with sensory issues. So we're doing constant regulation. We're constantly face-to-face. -face. We're hand-to-hand -hand toileting. So when it comes to just the social distancing piece and being comfortable enough to be interacting with each other and with students, that's going to be huge just to get used to being able to do that again because it's been something that is so not okay for us to do right now and it's completely opposite of what we're used to doing on an everyday basis. And just knowing that you're keeping kids safe and at the same time keeping yourself safe while still be able, being able to do your job. Um, I think that's going to be a huge mental thing for us to be able to just kind of work through and I, I don't know, come to terms with so that way we can be effective every day just how we were. So I think that will be the biggest impact that it will have um, because in schools we are just, I mean, we're a community. So to not be able to be a community and then throw us back in and it's just going to take a little bit of time, I think, for everyone to readjust uh, and get back to that normal schedule or what the new normal will look like. To kind of build off of that, it kind of flows into my next question for Josette, which I asked before I knew your background in, in counseling. So this is, this will be interesting, especially returning back, you know, the kids, you know, I know how much it's affected my mental health and, and having to readjust my daily schedule and still feel like I'm getting the enrichment that I need and I'm not just going from one screen to another. But now moving back to those students and getting them back in the classroom, before COVID, how important was it to be able to recognize and properly handle, you know, mental health issues in a regular classroom and now moving to post-COVID? How, how important is that going to be? Oh, you're muted again. <laughs> Sorry, That's, doing this on the phone is, tr is tricky today. Um, it was, it's always important 
to consider mental health in a classroom setting just in general. Our school is um, very focused on that. That's actually one of our founding principles with the social education being even more important than the actual teaching part. So we have things in place already in our school that we do daily with the kids right from the get-go. So right from when they walk in, there's procedures that they're used to. Um, we have meetings every day. We have greetings every morning getting kids back into that routine and it's extremely important in general to know um the mental health outlook of everybody and it starts with you and i think that that's where a lot of us forget that we're human too you know we talk about the kids all the time but we also have to focus on ourselves as well and being able to be vulnerable for those kids so that they know that we all have bad days, right? So where do we go from there? And what does a bad day look like? And acceptance for kids that also um, struggle with different types of situations, um, mental health, um, educational, learning differences, and how they are handled. To know how to de-escalate a situation and not escalate a situation. And as a teacher to trust your gut. I know every district, every school has their own policies and procedures in place um, for how to handle a situation if a situation arises in a classroom. But I think sometimes we forget that as a teacher and as a person, you also have a gut feeling as to how something can begin to be handled and follow through with that as well. So those daily check-ins are super important. Um, I check in with every kid. Actually, when they come in, we greet them at the door. Um, that's just something that I've done for the past 17 years. A thumbs up, a thumbs down, a thumbs sideways. The kids know, like, you can let me know before you walk in, like, today is not the day. Um, and I, I know that ahead of time. And when you build those relationships, and I'm going to keep going back to that, knowing a kid is the most important thing in your job. And that will make you successful as an educator. You need relationships to teach. It seems like, um, especially since you're talking about the relationships that you build, how has now transitioning to this online platform, um, how are you handling your day-to-day -day lessons? Um, so uh, our school was actually prepared for this, and I use that like in air quotes. We were already actually getting um, Google Classrooms we have regularly set up within the school. So the day that this happened on Friday the 13th, which I'm totally, Friday the 13th have always freaked me out, which is like the running joke at school. We had a staff development day that day and this was all coming down. So we had set up, we, we strategized, we got into small groups, people that were really good with technology, helped other teachers set up Google Classrooms that have never used it before. So that Friday we actually spent like six or seven hours building Google Classroom. So we were gonna be ready to go if we got the, you're not opening on Monday. Um, so our kids were familiar with it, which was great. Um, I do videos, we were doing Zoom, but we can't do Zoom anymore. So we're doing Google Meets. Um, so I do live lessons with my kids. Um, we have lunch together once a week on a meet. I do that with all my students. Um, we've been doing the teacher caravan, which we've been going to visit 450 students in 25 zip codes. We've been working on that as a school for over a week. Um, I have had phone calls with every one of the kids I teach, 104 of them and their families. And I check in with them every single week. It's a lot of work, um, but it's worth it to me in the end. And the kids' mental health is just as important as their educational learning. And when you make a relationship, the kids want to work. And I think that's the biggest piece for people to know. Like, they're going to work to the best of their ability. Every kid can't do the same thing. But if you show them that you're really there for them and that, you know, you're, you're worried about them as a, as a family, them as an individual, it, it'll all work out in the end. So for me, it's hard because I wanna see them. I wanna be able to like interact with them because that's how my classroom works for me specifically um, to joke around with them. So we, we do that. You know, I have silly videos like every morning that I post for them. Um, I do our regular morning meeting and they respond. So I've been very fortunate that this has worked for me, not in the way 
emotionally I'd like for it to work because I'd love to be with the kids and this is killing me as an educator to not actually be with them. But for me, this is the best case scenario because I've had access to tools that make me feel extremely successful still. Mm -hmm. We've had, I live on a dead end street and we had a 40 car parade the other day and it was very entertaining watching everyone try and turn around. Um, it was probably us. <laughs> it was, it's uh, those are really fun to see and it and it just goes to show how much more work educators do than what what I think some people think it's not just mm -hmm. the classroom time it's it's a lot more time um, and the dedication that that you guys have um, and speaking of that let's look at that transition Marion what are some struggles that educators face in the classroom that the public probably don't know about I think there's a ton. Um, what I would say is the biggest thing that educators struggle with that new teachers coming in, even students now who are looking to become educators, is the realization that these students are not perfect, their families are not perfect. They come from a wide range of everything. So when you have all of these pressures put on teachers to do all of these different things without taking into account that this child might not live with mom and dad who are together or uh, this child might not have both a mom and a dad or this mom might have overdosed and they now live with grandparents or uh, just this child and I mean might be going through this cancer battle or this is happening at home and really just taking into account all of the real life things that these kids are dealing with, whether they're at the capacity to handle it or not, we as educators have to understand it and work through that on top of being able to do our jobs, which is get them to learn and get them to succeed. So really trying to find that balance. So I think the public, if they're not aware of those things, just really has to come to terms with that and really understand that and be empathetic with that, that not every child has it as good as some others do or maybe as good as they do. And going back to building relationships, that's one thing again that you may not be taught how to do, but you do have to learn that very quickly. And it has to be something that is very genuine that kids are going to receive and, and know that it's real uh, because they can see through it if it's not. Uh, and that comes from your three, four-year-olds through your 18, 19, 20-year-olds. Um, they just know. They know things that are real and they know things that aren't. So uh, that's what I would say. Just understanding the real-life struggles that these kids have, the home lives that they have. Things aren't always perfect, but to be able to be there as educators and to have that public support through that would be really, really uh, beneficial. I think um, you know, one of the things that we want to do with these panels is, is give a look into the, the real world of, of that career. Um, but at the same time, we also don't want to scare them away from it as well. So that leads me to my next question, because I really do think that as, as hard as it is, there's a reason that teachers are so dedicated. And it is because of the successes and the joys that they take away from it, which is the question I'm, I'm going to ask. Ray, what are the joys and the victories that you take home with you each week. Yeah, no, I think uh, I think Mary, you just hit it spot on. <laughs> but uh, you know, I think I can kind of uh, work off that and saying, you know, it's so great to you know be observing a classroom and you know you see a kid who kind of gives a teacher their run for their money and they're, they're <laughs> working hard and they're doing a good job. And then you know a week goes by and you're out in the hall and you know watching transition and that kid runs up to you and and they're like. Mr. Bailey, you know, I, I did this in class and I, I got it on the first try and it's like, yeah, man, like rock on, like you got it. So, you know, like seeing just those, just those little things where that kid is just so overly joyous to just go kind of like spread the news. And, um, you know, they may not be the, the rock star student that's on merit roll or honor roll or, you know, has their, their name plastered around the school. And, um, you know, we try to, to recognize those kids and, and, you know, whether it's a phone call home and, and saying, mm -hmm. hey, you know, your kid did an awesome job today and, you know, let's keep it up. Uh, those, those little things go a real long way. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, the, the kids love it, the parents love it. And, and you know what, just to, to be able to make that positive atmosphere in a school like that, that, that great, create that um, positive school culture, school climate. 
it makes a world of difference. So, um, you know, you got that positive mindset that, you know, anyone can, can do what, what we're doing. And, you know, whether you're about to graduate or you're just stepping foot in the, in the Madai, like, you know, you got it. Like, you know, we, we are here for you. Um, you know, we're living proof that, uh, you know, we're, we're just as success, uh, successful as, as you can be. So you know, have that positive mindset, look out for those kids and, you know, cause that, that might be them that you're talking to one day. That's great. That's great. Um, so I have one more question. We do have some extra questions that, that were submitted and we're going to try and keep this short. Um, but just on the, uh, this, on this last one, because, you know, we hear a lot of talks about standardized mm -hmm. testing in the news and all that. So. Josette, knowing that it's a large part of education, standardized testing, um, how do you balance the requirements of the test with your classroom style? Um, so I do backwards planning. So I start from the back of the, the end of the year, what I want the kids to know when they walk out of the classroom, uh, whatever grade that I'm teaching, and then plan for the rest of the school year. Um, I look at all the standards that need to be taught and the, the ways that I can uh, attack each one of those standards. So backwards planning, making sure the standards are attacked. They can be done in various modes and various ways. There's not just one way to teach a standard. There's not just one way to test it. It doesn't always have to be formalized testing. Um, I do quick checks. I do quick, the kids are used to seeing me walk with a clipboard. I give them a minute or two to do something. We do a quick check in, we move on. You can do you know, exit tickets. There's so many different ways that you can hit all the standards that need to be taught and you don't need to teach to the test. And I think that that's where um, some, you know, people think like that's what we do. And that as an educator, I can only speak for myself, but we, I don't teach to the test. I teach the skills that are necessary and then we go from there. Um, so I guess that's, that's my classroom style. There's ways to do it. You know, like I said, there's so many different ways and so many creative ways and so many ways to te to hit on each one of the kids learning styles. It doesn't have to look the same for every kid and it doesn't have to look the same in every single classroom. Cool. Um, Kristen, I'm going to ask you this question. This one was submitted by, uh, I believe one of the students. What was your transition from undergrad to graduate school like? Can you kind of talk about um, maybe what what you weren't expecting out of grad school or uh, just kind of ex ex talk about your experience with that? Um, I went to Damon College for my undergraduate and I went to Madai for my graduate degree. Um, I initially I chose Madai because they offered uh, literacy education, um, which is a certification that I felt would be helpful uh, going into my field. Um, and Damon didn't offer that program. So that was one of the benefits of, you know, why I chose Madai. Um, you know, I chose I, Madai also because I like the small classroom setting. So I felt that that was an important transition because coming from Damon, I was used to a small, small class settings, a more intimate settings. There was no lecture halls. There was not a lot of like, I mean, I know the world has changed since I graduated from Madai in 06. So it was, you know, it's different now. A lot more things are, are digital, but I felt that I always learned best in a small, more intimate environment, being able to make personal connections. So I think that's important to find how, like we tell our students, how do you learn best? Do you learn best in a small environment? Do you gain, you know, do you work better with a large group, you know, sitting in a lecture hall? Do you work better taking online classes? So I knew even when I went for my admin, um, I ended up going to Fredonia, again, a small, intimate program. There was no online components. It was all face-to-face. -face. So I think it's important when you're making that transition, no matter how many institutes you attend, is you find which institute can offer the kind of setting where you're going to be most successful as a student. So I think that's, that's most important. Also, you know, if you want to stay close to home, if you want to venture out, um, and also looking at the schools and the colleges and what connections they have within your, your local community to the various schools, because a lot of the professors are working as educators and leaders in our schools throughout, you know, Western New York. So that's an important connection to look for, I think, as well. Um, Sarah, I think you'll be able to answer this question. Oh, I think I'll be good. But um, did you have any negative experience while student teaching? And if so, kind of what did you do to address it? How did you learn from it? Maybe had um, some negative experience in my second student teaching placement. I, 
my first uh, student teaching placement was in second grade, uh, and my second one was in sixth grade ELA in science. And um, I think if I could go back, I would have requested to have student taught maybe in the fall instead of the spring because I felt like um, the particular district that I was in for my experience, uh, the first two weeks of my student teaching was test prep, just getting ready for that test, doing packet after packet after packet. And then they went on um, spring break for two weeks. And then they came back and they had two weeks of state testing. And my, um, so the pressure was then on me I, in my final week of student teaching to fit in um, two observations in the same week with my uh, supervisor, uh, one in ELA, one in science. And these kids were already like burnt out from being tested. So I, I felt like I could have done better had I been able to see maybe how to set up a classroom in the fall and maybe how it started from start to finish and maybe have seen uh, more of that relationship building than coming in um, from mid-March to May and just trying to jump in and uh, go from there, so. Okay. Um, Marion, I'll ask you this one. And and I I, I imagine it's, it's the, the principles are probably the same, but it's gotta be a little bit different. Um, this was also from a student. How do you keep your students engaged and focused during such a long day? Oh boy. Um, I think it definitely depends on the grade level and the students' levels. Um, so this one could also go out to the other administrators too who are here. Uh, Buffalo Hearing and Speech with our students being special needs, um, needing a lot more of that hands-on uh, face-to-face -face interaction, human interaction with people. One thing that we do limit is our screen time. We are more so involved with hands-on learning, uh, working on communication skills, uh, being one-on-ones together through play, through uh, sensory things, through being able to get to the gym and interact, I guess, I would say with one another and finding out what works best for each child, especially with students who have those communication needs and may not be able to verbalize how they're feeling or what they want to do, really understanding their different ways of communicating. That's the best way for me to help with my students and keeping them engaged. You really do have to, again, build relationships with students, know what they like and what they don't like, and I think then they can have that level of respect to want to work for you, even when you're pushing them to do things that they may not they may not be so interested in or so much want to do. But then knowing that you care enough about them too to do things that they are interested in or do like to do as well. The relationship piece I think is absolutely huge. A lot of people think, well, kids nowadays they're so digital, they're so into their phones, they love that technology piece. Uh, it's a give and take there. They like it for their social media. That doesn't mean they want to play Kahoot 100% of the time in the classrooms or play those games. That's not necessarily what they're into. I think they really just need people who care about them, who can give them material, whatever it is, in a way that they can understand it, whether it's auditory, uh, through, again, hands-on, through visual, just really being able to differentiate that for them so that way there's a mixture um, knowing what they like again and what they don't like and, and just wanting to do whatever you can do to reach them. And again, that can also be going to their basketball games, sporting events, and supporting them in what they do. Uh, when they see that you care, they care to really work hard for you and it's like that give and take. So you'll, you'll get the most out of them when you show that you're willing to kind of put in a lot of work and effort um, and show that you care. So we have one more student question, and, and I think that Ray or Chris, I mean, any of you can answer, but I think from an administrative standpoint, this uh, student wants to know, how do I make myself stand out as a teacher? So I guess there's a lot of different ways you can answer that, but, but from that you know, administrative role, what do you notice about teachers? Uh, are you talking like, I, I'm, I'm kind of getting that question as more so maybe like someone looking for a job, like some, something along the lines of that or? Um, poss I guess we could go both ways. Um, you know, as a teacher to, to maybe get that recognition, not necessarily, you know, the pat on the back, but know that you're doing your job to the best of your ability. What, what are you doing to stand out in, in that aspect? And probably also, how, how do you get a job? What is the best way? Um, so I think a, a 
you know, now that it's kind of hiring season, I'm sure, Kristen, you're doing the same. I'm sure you got some positions open up in your school. Um, you know, so as we as we start to, you know, look through look through applicants, um, you know, we're looking to uh, see that one that they're uh, certified in their in their field. So you know, make sure you're taking your certification exams and getting those, and then two, just uh, you know, kind of maybe like a, a variety of positions. So. Um, you know, along the lines of that, we talked about networking today and, um, you know, maybe have a, a, a letter from someone um, or, or, or even just a, uh, just a recommendation. So, uh, you know, you look through and see, oh, oh this person might be connected with, uh, uh, you know, someone at Falk. I used to work there. I can maybe find out about them or, or you know, maybe, maybe understand a little bit more. But, uh, you know, I, th I think Kristen said it earlier, um, you know, the difference between her and I on paper is, is very little. Um, you know what what sets us apart is uh, you know just uh, maybe just the, some of the experiences we've had that you know maybe makes me a better fit in Sweet Home or her a better fit in, in Maryvale. So um, you know I, I think for teachers um, you know I think the, the number one thing that that we look for is is someone who can uh, you know form that relationship maybe work with that kid that doesn't always want to work in the classroom every day and maybe has those those uh, special skills or uh or talents to to uh, reach those kids and two someone who's just willing to to work with us um you know be a be a team player i think that's that's kind of important in, in all our goals so um you know for those teachers that are are out there looking for their jobs um you know it, it doesn't hurt to you know maybe look up the school that you're you're applying to and and send a quick email and say hey this is what kind of sets me apart because you know maybe the the applicant tracker doesn't allow you to do that so um you know there there's all those all those little things that uh uh that that you can do but i think first and foremost it's it's a uh, you know, just uh, just being a person who's willing to go to work every day and you know, do whatever they can to, to succeed. Cool, Kristen. Do you want to add anything? I think it's just important once you do get to that position and you do get to that school that you know you. Sorry about my my daughter's in the background with my dad, so you might hear her. Um, I think it's just important. To, I watch and pay attention really, you know, to the students that you know certain teachers in our building where they eat lunch with them they go to their classrooms during free periods. Um, they are at the door in the morning and they're greeting kids. Um, and I really pay special attention to that and I pay special attention to those teachers who connect with those really tough kids. Um, so I think that's important, you know, to bring your own, you know, personal um, spark into things. Um, you know, and also when you come into an interview, you know, really, really bring that, that personality that, you know, that what makes you special, what makes you, unique and what would make you a good fit for that building. And I think Ray said it, you know, really research that district, um, get in there, um, really see, you know, is this going to be a good fit for me personally? Like working at Maryvale, I know myself, like I said, I live in the community. My daughter will be going through Maryvale. Uh, my mom's a Maryvale graduate. I grew up in the Cheektowaga area. Um, so being a part of Maryvale, you know, when I you know started working with them with the 21st century program, you know, I really brought that in, you know, to my, district and our, our, our superintendent and I just communicated that you know this is my community this is my home it's been my home you know my daughter's going to go through here and I want to make this a good place and I'm going to invest everything I can and make this a good place so I think just you know bringing that that enthusiasm and continuing that momentum once you get that job I think is really important cool. well I want to end on a positive note so I want to give each of you the opportunity to kind of give your parting words of wisdom or advice to the students um, that, that are watching this. So uh, we'll just kind of go around around the screen again. So Marion, why don't we start with you? I would say be yourself and be your best, most genuine, honest self. Again, that doesn't mean to settle or to be complacent in who you are and not want to grow. You definitely want to grow but just being true to yourself uh, again getting those experiences in where you think that it's going to help you build good character um, build great responsibility and just grow in whatever it is that you're trying to do uh, but yeah that that would be my thing you just want to be honest stay true to yourself and continue to grow Josette? um i think my big thing would be be genuine i always say to the kids you do you do you um, and don't be afraid to ask for help if you need it because everyone is there to help each other and that includes kids. Cool. 
Sarah? I guess my parting uh, thoughts would be to um, remember on your hard days why you wanted to become a teacher. And um, I think that what ends up happening is that the positives and the reason why you wanted to get into this profession, why you wanted to become an educator, why you um, get up every morning and do your job is outweighing the rough times and the hard days. And um, that's not to say that the hard days won't come and that uh, there won't be challenges or obstacles that come with this profession. No one said this profession was going to be easy, but it is rewarding. And I think everyone can agree here that um, we love what we do. And if we didn't, we wouldn't be here. Cool. Uh, Kristen. I would say my biggest advice is to, you know, uh, build relationships. It's, it, it's at the heart of what we do every single day. Um, don't be afraid to ask questions. Don't be afraid to admit that you don't know something, that you're still learning the process. Um, and really put yourself out there. And if you do make a mistake, don't ever count it as a failure. Take it as something to propel you forward and to, you know, make you a, a better educator. And Ray. Yeah, so, um, you know, Kristen, you kind of stole what I was going to say there, but, you know, <laughs> we've been kind of, we talk a lot about relationships, and, and, you know, if I can just go back to my time at my die, two people that really helped shape me, uh, Todd Riniolo in the psych department, I actually started at my die as an education major and switched to psych because of Todd, uh, he was a, a, a great teacher and, and really helped me through my time at my die, and then uh, Rich Jacob, uh, he's someone I, I talk to every now and then uh, today, uh, I played basketball for him. Uh, when, when he was the coach there and you know he really gave me a lot of confidence that year that I, I played for him uh, and you know really kind of shaped me into the, the man that I, I am today so um, you know relationships uh, were huge for me as, as part of a die and you know I take that as a as a uh, assistant principal now um, so you know hopefully that that kind of is, is one theme that uh, students that are watching this uh, see very cool well thank you all so much for for being part of this and if any of the students that are watching have questions for any one of these individuals, feel free to reach out to Kristen or Laura in Trio or myself. You can find our emails in the directory, but I know that you guys are in connection with, with Kristen and Laura in Trio, and then we will make sure we get those questions to these panelists for you. Um, so feel free if you do have if you do have additional questions, if we didn't touch on something today and you still have a question. Um, just like our other panels, you will be able to reach out to them, them personally. So um, again, to, to the five of you, thank you so much for being part of this panel and um, best of luck on returning back. I'm sure it'll be like the first day of school when the kids know that they're not really gonna get any homework, it's just gonna be a big party. And I know we're ready for that. Um, so thank you again for being part of this and uh, we look forward to having you all back on campus as well when this is done. All right, thank you. Thank you so much.